In this video, we're going to talk about fortifications that the Nephites built. In 72 BC, according to the Book of Mormon, Captain Moroni helped fortify the Nephites, helped the Nephites build fortifications to prepare for an invasion uh, from the Lamanites and to defend themselves. And so we're going to take a quick look at what the Book of Mormon says about that, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the fortifications and what we can see um, of fortifications in our day. Okay, it's a, we'll go to Alma chapter 48, verse 8. It says, uh, Yea, he, that's Captain Moroni, had been strengthening the armies of the Nephites and directing small forts or places of resort, throwing up banks of earth round about to enclose his armies, and also building walls of stone to encircle them about, round about their cities and the borders of their lands, yea, all round about the land. So it says they did several things here. They built small forts, place, they built places of resort, um, meaning places to resort to for defense. <clears throat> they were uh, throwing up banks of earth and they would to be enclose the armies. So you're thinking um, fortifications to, to surround armies and then building walls of stone also for that. And then they also built around the cities and, and the borders of the land all round about the land. And then in Alma 50, uh, verse 1, it says, They are digging up heaps of earth round about all the cities throughout all the land which was possessed by the Nephites. And in verse 11, again, fortifying uh, the line between the Nephites and the Lamanites between the land of Zarahemla and the land of Nephi. So they are fortifying uh, throughout the land of Zarahemla and between the land of Zarahemla and where the Lamanites were on the south and fortifying the cities. So uh, the question is, can those fortifications be found? And the answer is, yes, they can. And so in this video, we're going to look at fortifications that fit the descriptions in the Book of Mormon. And these fortifications were built by the Hopewell civilization in the time frames uh, described in the Book of Mormon. And so we're gonna do a little, I'm gonna give you some slides to talk about each of the fortifications that, uh, that we've been able to identify that fit the descriptions in the Book of Mormon. And then at the end, kind of do a virtual tour a little bit of them. And I'm gonna pause to put the screen up. So here's a map uh, showing uh, all the locations where fortifications that uh, match the description in the Book of Mormon have been found. And so the red are fortifications that were built by the Hopewell that fit the um, descriptions in the Book of Mormon and fit the time frame in the Book of Mormon. And uh, we're going to talk about each of these. And um, so of the known Hopewell fortifications that date uh, to Book of Mormon time frames. Most are found in Ohio. There are also some in West Virginia, Western New York, Western Pennsylvania, Kentucky, and Tennessee. But in, even in those locations, it's, it tends to be around Ohio. And we're going to go through some of these fortifications one by one. We'll just quickly go through so that you can see uh, the, the different fortifications um, that fit the Book of Mormon, and then we'll talk a little bit uh, hopefully do a, in Google Earth, uh, you can see a couple of these. Okay, so uh, first one is uh, known as Fort Ancient. It is a little bit northeast of Cincinnati, Ohio. It was a large um, uh, Hopewell uh, city. Um, it's, it encompasses over 100 acres, and as you can see from the uh, from the pictures there, it's sort of a, uh, a hilltop, and then the walls were built around the edges of the hill to protect them. The walls reach up to 20 feet. They're uh, ditches on the outside of the outside of the, the city walls, so they would they dug up the earth from outside, deep ditches, and then uh, to make those hills. And then there are some entrance ways, and you can see on the right there, an example of one of the entrance ways through the earth wall. It looks like hills in the picture, but that's the earth wall 
that they had built with a with a an entrance way through it. Fort Ancient is a prime example uh, matching a fortified Nephite city, like what is described in the Book of Alma. It was fortified with four, it took four miles of walls up to 20 feet high surrounding this over 100 acre enclosed location. It's on a hill uh, down to the river. On the one side, it's over 200 feet. And uh, the carbon dating fits the right time frame. Uh, to me, it's clearly a city. Now, if you go to the site, they'll uh, contest and say, oh, no, they don't think it was a city. They think it was just sort of a ceremonial type gathering spot. But there are signs of habitation uh, within the city. And there's also signs of sophisticated crop domestication and agriculture, which shows a long term um, population growing and domesticating crops, um, large fields in that area. So it really it was clearly a city at the time of the Book of Mormon, large city with uh, walls fortifying it, just like the way it's described in the Book of Mormon. Okay, so as I said, it's it's um, uh, northeast of, of Cincinnati. The next one we'll look at is known as Fort Hill. This is sort of in central Ohio, southwest, the Chillicothe area. And as you can see with a three dimensional view there, it's also a hill with a relatively flat top area and they built walls on the ridges of the hill. These walls have no ceremonial uh, you know, shape for beauty purposes. They're clearly for defensive fortification as they're put on the ridge to maximize uh, the, the elevation advantage that um, the attackers would have to, to surmount in order to attack whoever is inside. Now the fort, this Fort Hill is an example of a fortified place of resort that was talked about. It's right by, there's a lot of habitation, rural farming villages type areas. And this appears to have been a place where they would, in the event of attack, uh, go up the hill and be within this uh, fortified location that was at the top of the hill. It was about a 500 foot, relatively a steep hill. I've been there and when you when you hike up it, it you get a little bit gassed. Um, uh, going up. It. it doesn't take all that long to get up, less than an hour, but um, if you were a Lamanite uh, running up, it would certainly um, it would certainly wear you out a little bit as you run up and also expose you to the, uh, to the weapons that the Nephites would be casting down at you. Uh, the fortification at the top, the walls enclosed about 48 acres. It had uh, pits uh, within the walled area for storing water. It's a good example of a fortified place of defense where it lets them attack from high ground. Um, there are on a couple of the prominent uh, spots on the site uh, that are visible from a distance. There's some evidence of large fires there, which opens the possibility of uh, locations of signal fires that could be seen from a long way away to indicate, you know, we're under attack or, or whatever it is that they wanted to signal uh, at a distance. Okay, a third one is called Spruce Hill. This is also in the Chillicothe area, even closer to Chillicothe. I think Chillicothe area is the, the area of the great city, Zarahemla, by the way. This is another, a place of resort, which uh, in that densely populated uh, Chillicothe area, they could have uh, ascended the hill <clears throat> Again, you can see from the map, it's a the three dimensional. It's a relatively flat top hill. Again, you should know uh, that Jerusalem uh, in the old world is an example of a relatively flat top hill, and um, so it indicates you know why they might have looked at that as ideal for a place for defense, where you can have all your people up in a relatively flat top space with the with the advantage of elevation for defense. It's a large area that encompasses over 140 acres. So that can, that can handle a lot, a lot of people at once. When you're talking about like Fort Ancient and Spruce Hill and 
enclosing areas of over 100 acres. You're talking about sites that could have handled 100,000 people or more uh, inside for, for a period of defense or with your armies or population that you're protecting. It's These are very, very large sites that would have been able to handle and protect very large populations, which also fits the Book of Mormon. Okay, so with this Spruce Hill, it's a relatively steep 400 foot tall hill, again, dated to the right time frame. On this one at the top of the hill, they don't have, it's not the ditches and walls, but instead they did it um, with walls of piled stones. So interestingly in the Book of Mormon, when it says walls of stone, it appears to have been stones, walls of stone, uh, uh, piled stones, as opposed to like masonry uh, type, type walls. But these uh, walls of piled stones have kind of uh, spread and are down a little bit. They're now currently about 15 to 20 feet wide, only three to four feet tall, but they projected anciently, perhaps those up to eight feet tall and less wide and uh, on top of the, the, at the ridges of the hill. And so this would provide a nice uh, defensive ground for protection. This again, at the top of the hill is a site that had water. Also on this site, they found evidence of high temperature, very high temperature fire, which actually produced slag. Now, many times you'll hear that, oh, well, the, the Native Americans in North America, the Hopewell, they didn't have uh, smelting we didn't have iron. This is a site that points uh, the other direction because they had high enough temperature fires to produce slag. And if so, if they had high enough temperature fires that were producing slag, that would indicate high enough temperature fires and the potential to uh, do metal uh, smelting, also possible uh, signal fires again for the other locations. Okay, the fourth uh, large site this is again in the Chillicothe area. This is called the Hopewell Mound Group. And this is sort of like a key center of that uh, Chillicothe area. I think this is, I picture this is sort of like the city center of the great city Zarahemla. So like the center of the center, uh, the great city Zarahemla. It's a large site also, again, over a hundred acres. This one is not at a particular ideal defensive location. Instead, it's a another example of a fortified city. It's large, like I said, large site, lots of signs of habitation in it and, and, uh, and nearby. They built walls around it. And um, those walls now have been plowed over for so many decades that, that you don't see the walls except in an area of the site where it goes into the woods and hasn't been plowed as much and you still see the, the walls in there that have been preserved some. But again, very large site. It took a two miles long earth wall all the way around it to encompass it. Encompasses 130 acre. Again, you're talking about it easily encompass a population of over 100,000. The earth walls at this time is four to six feet tall with exterior ditch. The walls, um, many think, had a timber palisade on top. Uh, and then inside the city, there's some interesting uh, things like a triple mound. Um, there was a, a hill with a large cache of, of items usable for weapons and things like that. We'll go on to the fifth site. This one's called Collarine Works and is uh, northwest of Cincinnati. Again, another very large fortification site and uh, encompasses about 95 acres. The walls had an average height of about nine feet and surrounded by a ditch. So again, just like uh, described in the, in the Book of Mormon. There was one, the one side of it did not have a wall, but it's on the side of the river and it's a river terrace that's, that's a, a good 30 foot drop. And I guess I figured that that, that part was good enough, um, better than what we had for the the wall the rest of the way around. So they just only did the most way around, but not where the river terrace was. All right, site number six, Glenford Fort. Now there was a large Hopewell population in central Ohio in the Newark, Ohio area. And the Newark area is where you have uh, some famous earthworks. Um, 
And uh, just south of Newark is this, it's a hilltop fortification, would have been a place for a uh, place for resort. You can see from the three-dimensional pictures there, it's a hill, again, flat-topped hill with, with walls around the edges, uh, similar to the type that was described in the in the other ones. Here's a picture of some individuals up on the wall. Now this is like um, like one of the other sites. Instead of using earth, they used uh, uh, walls of stone, walls of piled, piled stones. And uh, for this one, it's the average is about 20 feet wide, three to six feet tall. Again, ancient times, it was probably tall or less wide and is just kind of uh, disintegrated and slumped down over the many centuries of time since. Radiocarbon dates, again, fit the right time frame. It's a good example of a, another place of resort. A lot of these places have very similar names, Fort Hill, Fort Ancient, Fortified Hill, lots, lots of very similar names. It's because each one that was found, they've realized, okay, it's a, it's a fort on a hill. So that's why you get the names, uh, similar names over and over again. But this was another example of a place of resort. This was north of Cincinnati. Um, so there's been a few around that Cincinnati area. There've been a few around that Chillicothe area. Uh, one so far around Newark, we'll see others and you kind of get to see the main population areas that the Hopewell or the Nephites had. So again, three-dimensional, you see it's a, it's a hill with a wall around the ridges of the hill again. It was about, the hill was about 250 feet high and steep. The walls were five to 10 feet high. This, these walls, they have the wall, but not a ditch. So maybe the ditches had been sort of filled in since then, or maybe they borrowed the, the earth, not, not quite the same as they did in the other ones, but, um, and this had a nearby pond. Okay, so we'll go through the other forts a little, you know, just briefly so that you can see them though. This one's called Carlisle Fort. It's sometimes called the Big Twin Works Fort. It's further north of Cincinnati, uh, closer to Dayton. So it's southwest of Dayton. And again, you see in the three-dimensional picture there how they use the landscape of this projecting hill as a site to build a wall and a fortification there. This would have been a place of resort. The dating for this one places at first century AD, so about 100 years after uh, the other ones, but the carbon dating is not super reliable, so it, it's still approximately the right time frame. It could very well be done at the same time as the other ones, or it could have been done later. This one encompassed about 15 acres, so still a, still a large site. Here's another one also near Dayton, this time east of Dayton. It was called the Pollock Works site. This was a 12 acre fortified area, again, using the uh, natural location with the, with, the, with the channel of the creek. Uh, so you may have that natural raised elevation spot that they built the walls around for defense. This has been a, another example of a place of resort. The carbon dating for that one tentatively dated to 50 AD. Again, approximately the right time frame. Um, carbon dating isn't exactly accurate. There's always a plus or minus aspect of that. There's the chance for a contamination that can move those carbon dates. Uh, some, but it, it fits the approximate right time frame. The earthwork wall on this one was three to 10 feet high, had the exterior ditch, like described in the Book of Mormon, and encompassed 12 areas. It also had a timbered uh, stockade on top of the walls. This is another site where they see slag showing the ability for, for working metals, as described in the Book of Mormon. The working of metals is often pointed to as one of the uh, anachronisms of the Book of Mormon saying that the, the people in that time frame in the Americas didn't have that technology, but there's evidence pointing that they in fact did. Okay, and then number 10, the Miami Fort. This is on the very southwest part of Ohio at the junction of the Ohio River and the Great Miami River. And right at that junction, 
sort of, so you can imagine sort of like a, a junction entryway to the land. They have this uh, fort, it was a 12 acre uh, fort with walls there. Unclear whether it would be a, a city or a place of resort, but it's a hilltop fortification there. The walls were up to about 12 feet high. Uh, it did have large wooden posts in the walls that's been confirmed with LIDAR. So it was quite the fort there. Uh, number 11, Fortified Hill. This is another one called Fortified Hill. This one's near Granville, Ohio, which is west of the Newark Earthworks. It's again on a hill, earth walls on the, on the ridges of the hill for defensive purposes. The walls were eight to 10 feet high in addition to the adding to the hill height, encompassed about 18 acres. So again, a very large uh, fortification. And then um, entrances are near spring and good for good ascent. This is another place that could have been a place of resort for the populations of the hopeful that live near those Newark earthworks as well. There's another fortification at a location called Four Mile Creek. This fort did not have a name, um, large 25 acre fort, also north of Cincinnati. And uh, this one was on a bluff uh, with walls, uh, little, not quite as high walls, but on a natural bank, making a fort there. And then the finally, the last large fortification, I say large fortification in Ohio, there's additional small ones, but this is one where it's a little bit different. This is um, an example of an assembly area, an earthwork with a, with a square and a circle um, that appeared to have been for assembly or ceremonial areas, but were then fortified. And there's a very large circle, so over a thousand foot diameter, which makes 18 acres. And then a square, and the, the square had high walls as well, but the, the circle, uh, seemed to be like a place of um, last refuge and fortification. They built uh, deep ditches around it. Um, so the ditches went 15 to 19 feet below the earth level, and then on top of the on top of the, uh, the on top of that ground level, additional five foot higher so earth walls. So you know the the difference is about over almost 25 feet there. And over time, imagine that that has eroded and filled in some. So quite deep ditch and large walls. And then there's also evidence of a palisade as well used with that fortification. So that's an example of, of a city area that has a place of assembly that they then fortified as a place that the, the people there could resort to for defense within their city. So those previous 13 were are all of the large fortifications in Ohio, each of those enclose at least 10 acres that are all large ones. They're all, all of them are located in Southern or Central Ohio. And these could hold large armies and populations. Now, a lot of times people will say, oh, but the, the Native Americans didn't have such large populations. And that's uh, commonly thought as true, but it's not. In fact, um, these held very large Fortifications, and I want you to think about fortifications in particular in terms of the populations, because when you build something, the architecture is generally sized to meet the need that you have. So if you build a fort that's too big, it's wasteful. You're, you're doing a whole lot of effort for something that you don't need. But in particular, for defensive purposes, it's not just wasteful, but it's counterproductive because the bigger your fort, the harder it is to, to appropriately man and defend. So when you build a fortification, you're choosing a size that you need to house all of your armies or population that are going to be needed there. You only want to build it uh, big enough as you need to, not to, so that you can spend your time making better fortifications instead of making a gigantic fortification that you can never defend the walls of. So the fort size implies a population big enough to need them, which implies that you're talking in these locations of, of large populations, large armies, armies of potentially tens of thousands, populations of potentially 
hundred thousand or more for these various each of these various low large locations. So it's a very large uh, population area in the South Central Ohio area. Now, outside of the South Central Ohio area, the forts are smaller. And remember in Alma 48.8, it said, you know, it, the first thing it says was erecting small forts for places of resort. And then it also talks about fortifying uh, the cities and stuff. So there's lots of small forts as well. And most of these, they uh, don't even have names because they're not, they're not uh, that big. The remaining forts in Ohio are smaller. They're all, you know, less than five acres. Most of them are located in Northern Ohio. These are more likely to be things like army outposts or forts that are big enough for smaller uh, out outlying villages or populations. And would be for the types of armies where it'd be a few thousand people or less. An example of this would be the little Cedar Point Fort, which is right near the Cleveland, Ohio airport. And uh, right next to the airport, there's a, there's a river there uh, with a cliff down to the river and this fort was right on uh, the edge of the cliff at the river and so if people came in from <clears throat> you know the there's the Lake Erie and uh, then there's a little flat area next to Lake Erie so and then this is a uh, hilly tough air, tough terrain to cross here so if you had a, an army coming in they would likely come along the lake shore and then uh, you have a fort that's, you know, located in a deal place to, to spot and, and defend there. Okay, so that's one. Uh, there's another one just a little bit uh, northeast of Cleveland is another five acre hilltop fort. It's called Conneaut Works and, uh, and that's there. And then I'm just gonna go ahead and skip through a couple of these. There's another one, Madison Fort, nearby that one, 2.7 acres. Um, this is another site where nearby there's an, uh, indications of a furnace. Um, but uh, then you see here, so there, there are multiple small forts along this northern uh, seashore, um, lakeshore. Okay, and then there are also small unnamed not enclosed areas, but little fortification spots here and there that are near some of the large fortifications or other population areas. And um, I didn't bother trying to capture those, but those don't completely match the description because they're not the, you know, the enclosed with a large, uh, a large fortification, but instead you have these berms or other potential walls, not complete, but that looked like may have been used for uh, makeshift fortifications or to fight from particular points of location as opposed to, you know, protect your, your population or cities or anything. Okay, and then the outside of Ohio, there are some in the, in the nearby states too. We're going to look at a couple in West Virginia. The ones in West Virginia are along the Kanawha River or Ohio River bordering, bordering Ohio. Um, there was, in the 1800s, a description of an extremely large one on the Ohio River, just on the West Virginia side of the Ohio River, um, on eastern, eastern Ohio, just across the, the river in West Virginia. This was described as, a, as enclosing 400 acres with double earthwork walls. So there's one set of walls. 10 to 12 feet high, you know, these banks of earth. And then 120 feet in another wall, again, banks of earth, 10 to 12 feet high. And so this is large double walled 400 acre, 400 acre is um, multiple sizes of, of the other one. So extremely large uh, fortified area. But unfortunately, um, you can't see it now. It's just uh, 200 years of, of plowing and it's gone. And so you, you can no longer see uh, what's there. And, um, but, uh, but it was the early 1800s description of it was a, an incredibly large encompass site. Okay, and then uh, on the Kanawha River, uh, southeast of Charleston, West Virginia, there's a place called Mount Carbon. 
and it's where the Gali River um, meets and the New River and forming the Kanaha River. And there's this uh, there's this mountain there or a large hilltop. It's it's a mountain really because it's over a thousand feet, but at the top, over twelve hundred feet above the river, there's an extremely large uh, fortification built there. This one is walls made of piled stones. You can see on the right, um, very large um, in parts, very large walls. Now, at this point, it's it's broken down enough that the wall is no longer contiguous all the way around, but it's projected to have been. So like in that center uh, picture, it's like they can show where pieces of the wall were, and it, it sort of project that it continued around um, the ridge and uh, was just a place which would have been incredibly well fortified and difficult to access. It's a place where at the top, there's actually a spring inside and a source for flint, which is great for making uh, weapons. And so it's kind of an ideal area uh, to defend yourself. Interestingly too, there are two stone uh, spots where they think that those could have been uh, towers. So stone circular towers, they think is poss possibly as high as 20 feet high to give a tremendous vantage point to see a long distance in that area. It's a very hilly area. So would be um, a place where they could see that. It's also in an area where it's just a valley through uh, tough terrain to cross. It would be a, a location to where if people were trying to cross through, you're right there at the spot where they would be trying to go through in that valley. Okay, so that's where it's located, southeast of Charleston. And there on the left, you kind of see how high the mountain is. There's another one uh, right at Charleston, West Virginia. There's a little overlook and a hilltop fortification that was about 15, enclosing about 15 to 20 acres. So it was a large one and overlooking that area, again, along the river. That Charleston, West Virginia area actually has a lot of mounds too, and I think was a, a place of significant um, population. And then wrapping up with, so New York has a, a lot of small fortifications. Here's an example of one. This was northeast of Syracuse. Um, it's a three acre hilltop fort. And, um, and uh, that was, as you can see, sort of right in a, in a valley. Now, if someone was coming up, this is very hard terrain to cross. So what, what would most likely happen is someone would want to come and access through the valley here. And this is a location that's strategic right along that valley access. I think this is the narrow neck of land, by the way, to the land north in my uh, geographic model, but we'll talk about that in a separate, in a separate video. Uh, there are descriptions of additional fortifications. This, uh, a man named Clinton DeWitt in uh, the early 1800s talked about a whole 50 mile long line of occasional fortifications along uh, a valley along a creek and it'll be kind of this location here from the this Cataraugus Creek down to the Pennsylvania line he said there are intermittent fortifications all along that line down the valley and we don't have exact locations of where those were. We just have this reference to, to the existence of those. And we also don't have the carbon dating for those or for these uh, ones in uh, Western Pennsylvania as well. Um, but we have the descriptions and they seem to fit the type of thing that the hope we're doing as well. And they could date to the right type time frame. Uh, and then another description uh, that from the North from the Pennsylvania line further south, there's another chain of forts that was said to go along the Monongahela uh, River along there and several hilltop forts along that one as well. Again, uh, for these, the exact locations are unknown. In Kentucky, there are a couple as well. Um, in central Kentucky near the area of Berea, there's a mountaintop fort. This is a very high up 1700 feet uh, tall mountain and at the top there are these stone walls um, and um, now this one had 
um, artifacts that date all the way back to 580 BC. They don't know exactly when the walls were built. So we don't know when those walls were built. They're stone walls. Here's an uh, on the right there is a, you can see what the, the wall kind of has deteriorated down to now where it's just kind of stones in, in a pile along. Okay, and then there's another one. Um, oh, sorry, that's still the one at Biberea. And then in Tennessee, there was also, there's also one by Lexington, as I, but I, I didn't include that one here. Um, and then in Tennessee, there uh, is a location called Old Stone Fort, which is well known. And this one has a stone wall enclosing about 50 acres. And this is near Manchester, um, Tennessee. Um, in the Heartland model, they think that this could have been the, I think that they think this is the, in the land of um, city of Nephi, type area and, and that could fit. The, the walls here were four to six feet along this bluff around. Okay, so that takes us through all of those fortifications. Now what I want to do, I'm gonna pause for just a second. I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch to Google Earth is what I'm gonna do. Okay, great. Yeah, I just had to switch uh, applications. So I switched over to uh, Google Earth. And what I've done in uh, Google Earth is placed on a map all of these different uh, fortifications to the extent that we can identify uh, where they were. For some of them, the descriptions that we have from the 1800s aren't clear enough to know exactly where they were. But uh, the thing that's great about Google Earth is that you can do a virtual tour and you can kind of take a, take a look at uh, what uh, is currently there, and um, and you can kind of look at it three dimensionally, and you can kind of get an idea of okay, I understand, you know the uh, you know the defensive, you know purpose and what it looks like there. So for example, let's take a look at um, well, let's go ahead to look at that uh, Fort Ancient one. That was a good one. This would have been here. So this is the Cincinnati area, the Chillicothe area. So this is Fort Ancient here. All right, sorry, let's uh, go further in. Okay. And then, uh, like I said, so the one of the cool things with Google Earth is, so you can see how it's along, along a river and you had uh, the hill there. So with Google Earth, as you get in, you can switch over to a three-dimensional, sorry about that. I know it's probably disorienting for you, but switch to a uh, three-dimensional view and put that at north. Okay, and so, and you can kind of take a look. So this here is the, uh, there's a museum on site and this whole thing was the fortification and, and so you had the you had the walls and uh, sorry you had the the slopes and then you had the walls all the way along this thing and as i go down in closer you can kind of see the the walls a little bit so here's for example the wall over here sorry it's a lot of data for google earth and you said, see that it has, now this is, as you can see, it's all grown in since with, uh, with the trees, but you had the ditches on the outside and then the walls, and then uh, uh, there are some uh, places through to get through the walls. And you can sort of take a, take a look around and do a little virtual tour. So what I'd like to do, I'm still I'm still working on it, but at some point I'd like to get this Google Earth thing as something that uh, people could do so they can do their own sort of virtual tour of the uh, of all of these various sites, which is the, and you, here's an example of, of one of the mounds that was the interior mounds that was at, at that large site. And because um, I know not everyone can go out and go and look at uh, some of these Hopewell locations and see what they're like. Let's go ahead and take a look at, this was, the Fort Hill one over here. So this is one of those examples of, sorry, one of those examples of a 
fortified place of resort. And so what you had here is you had rural areas where they had all the, you know, their their farming and people and villages, and then they had a hill that they could uh, go to. Now, this is actually at the 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 place marker. It takes you to the little museum that's on site. So it's not the actual fortification. So what happens is, and let's switch to 3D. So what happens, and sorry, I got to reset back to normal. Okay, so you, you, if you drive in, you can go to the, the little museum there. I, I know it's over here, it looks like super small, but there's, so there's a little museum and a parking lot there. And then you can come and you can go up, up the hill. And, and you can, this, let me just make sure I got this right. Yeah, this is the hill. And um, I got to back out a little bit. Yeah, and so up here you had uh, you had a fortification site, and let's see, I thought you could go in and see a little bit where the ridges are. I think you still can. A little bit, you see a little bit, the wall ridges around the edge that that they had, and so, and then I think that these were places where they had the pits of pits that could hold ponds or water. And anyway, that's another example. Let's go ahead back out and take a look at that Spruce Fort site. And then we'll do a look at the Spruce Fort one. And then we'll take a look at that Armstrong Mountain Fort one in West Virginia. I think that'll probably be good enough. You get the idea. Okay, so the Spruce Hill one would have been over here, this one. So what you see here is, so this Chillicothe area, again, I think this is the great city of Zarahemla. This is the Scioto River, which I think is the Sidon River, a derivation of the Sidon name, Scioto, Scioto. Um, and then it had uh, valleys and uh, that city center area, that port, well, that's in that location there. Some have been to the Mound City and that's over here. In this valley, there is this place of resort and right on the edge of the valley, and again, all of this stuff along the valley would have been all, you know, good farming area. And um, and then you have this flat-topped hill that protrudes, and we'll switch to 3D. <clears throat> Reset it to north. Uh, and you can see, again, so it's, you know, I think this one was a couple hundred feet up, and you had this sort of flat-topped hill with the, uh, but they had the fort of uh, a wall around the edge. And um, so that was what that fortification was like. And let's do one more. And like I said, let's go take a look at the um, Armstrong Mountain Fort. And this is that one that was on the, the tall mountain, uh, an extremely, extremely good defense area. In a my geographic model, I think this is kind of like the, head of the river Sidon area. I think that the Kana New River, the, which is the longest tributary to the Ohio River, I think that was the uh, head of the Sidon River. And you have this, um, it's in the Book of Mormon, the head of the river Sidon is mentioned as a place of crossing and a place uh, that the armies would go. And what you have is very difficult land to cross. I mean, these don't look that large here, but they actually, these are all very, very hilly. And uh, so the, the only real effective way to go through all of this stuff in this part of the Appalachians is, is to go through the, the river valleys. And so that's where um, the armies would have traversed. Okay, so sorry, this is the, this is the fortification area up here. And let's switch to 3D. So, sorry, we set to north. And uh, so, again, you see this uh, very, very steep, tall a mountain. And, and this is where they had uh, up here on the mountain, large uh, stone walls and a place where they could, and that this is the place where they had the two towers that could look out. All right, well, I, that, uh, that should be enough for now. I, I hope that you uh, like this information. 
I hope that it's um, interesting to you, fascinating to you. It should support for you the truthfulness of the Book of Mormon, whether you accept um, the geography model I, I, I'm proposing or not, it doesn't matter. All of these show the types of things that uh, were, were in the Book of Mormon. If you are interested in this content, content and like uh, this type of information, I'm going to do a number of other videos related to evidence for the Book of Mormon. So please uh, hit the like and uh, subscribe and notification button so you can get that, uh, those videos and see those and also help others to get them. And I look forward to sharing that information with you. All right. Thank you.